Winona Ryder and an Oscar-winning performance by Angelina Jolie in Girl Interrupted over on Film 4 Now. In an hour here on Channel 4, the Silk Route through the Gobi Desert. First, a short season of programmes on what the politicians don't want us to know. Election unspun. Tony Blair was swept to power eight years ago using the slickest and most sophisticated political marketing strategy Britain had ever seen. It reached its peak in a cinematic party election broadcast. Painstaking market research guided every shot, cut and word to try and win over the floating voter. Can you take us to Elm Road? It's just the other side of the park. Of course I can, hop in. You want to walk in weather like this. Number 26, isn't it, Becky? How does she know my name? Over the past 25 years, the way elections are fought and won has been revolutionised. Did you vote then, Tom? How does he know your name? Uh, I meant to, uh, but we've been in casualty all evening. Oh, of course you have. All political parties now use sophisticated marketing methods to go after the small proportion of voters who really matter. It'll get better. Shame the health service won't. The floating voter is that elusive person who may change his or her mind for how he or she will vote, who also lives in a marginal constituency. And by the time you've counted noses, there's only maybe 800,000 to a million people in this country who determine who wins. But just as the political parties have mastered the art of selling themselves to the magic million who decide elections, so cynicism and disengagement has grown among everyone else. This film reveals how the increased use of marketing has changed Britain's political parties and the policies on which they fight elections. You get very cynical when you do have a marketeer all the time, kind of running the country. They've taken up to a different level now, the whole media thing. I mean, they didn't have really that in the 60s and 70s, but now it's the whole, like, media roadshow and the way that they're sort of almost produced, if you like, packaged and produced. I don't blame Tony Blair, he's just responding to what he thinks people want, and that's slightly the problem with this focus group politics and... Um, uh, Daz politics and hairdo politics and, and deep sincerity politics. It doesn't, if I can strain the simile, it doesn't wash. Politicians and the whole political system are growing further and further and further away from the electorate. If you go out there and talk to people, there's a sense of disillusion with the system as a whole that I don't remember in the past, and that is very dangerous. The relationship between politicians and the electorate used to be more straightforward. Robert. Mr. Churchill, scene two, take one. RT. Ladies and gentlemen, permit me, please, to claim your attention for a moment. Scene six, take one. Wait a moment. We are the chosen few. I can't remember it. I've right. uh, got on. one of the best memories that uh, you can have. I know, sir, but that's quite all right. Off. Quite all right. <clears throat> Don't worry. Look at the camera and start again, sir. We are the chosen few. For uh, the Roman uh, Empire. If we are uh, to be independent in foreign... Uh, wasn't that better? In 30 years following the Second World War, life and politics operated much more along class lines. Labour represented the workers, the Conservatives represented the bosses, 
The Liberals were somewhere in between. There were clear black and white philosophical differences between the Labour Party and the Conservative Party. The Labour Party believed in the redistribution of wealth. The Conservative Party believed in the creation of wealth. Fundamental differences. The Labour Party believed in, in state dependency. The Conservative Party believed in, uh, in, in people being independent of the state. The Labour Party believed in collective responsibility. The Conservative Party believed in individual responsibility. These are black and white differences. They are either end of a spectrum of choice. I think old-style election campaigns were really about the major political parties trying to get their supporters to the vote. They were pretty confident who their supporters were. People would vote on class lines and out of party loyalty lines. And in a sense, the election was decided by which party was more successful at mobilising its natural vote. Until 25 years ago, political marketing was far less sophisticated. This is our television operations room. Throughout the campaign, the leaders of the Labour Party will be speaking directly from here. By this time tomorrow week, the polls will have just closed and you will have cast your vote on the fate of Britain for up to the next five years. But the arrival of a woman as Conservative leader was to have a seismic impact on Britain. Despite appearances, Margaret Thatcher had a radical vision and an iron will. But there was one obstacle on the road to power. People didn't like her. Margaret had some elements of her character, image, whatever you want to call it, that were not popular. One was her voice, which um, people found rather schoolmarmish and rather hectoring in, in the tone that she adopted. Adrenaline well, it doesn't matter. Adrenaline's all right. Perfectly all right. And lung and tongue power, good. Right. <laughs> she was regarded as silly. She was regarded as shrill. Uh, she was regarded as uh, ignorant, someone who knew little about the world. Right. Come in. We called her Hilda. Other names too, of course. Att Attila the Hen went down uh, uh, quite well. Uh, the, the Immaculate Margaret. There were, there were all sorts of names, all of them mocking. She called in Tim Bell, the flamboyant managing director of advertising agency Saatchi & Saatchi. He was to transform the way British leaders communicate with the electorate by devising the first modern political marketing strategy. In a series of carefully choreographed photo opportunities, he gave her a new image. Plenty of height, Colin. Yes. The aim was to make her look likeable and credible. A woman who could run the country. And they made sure the papers wrote about it. I remember a famous spread where she was defrosting the fridge, um, cooking breakfast, going shopping. I mean, the early days of Tony on the couch, but they were rather more original in those days and they were, were the first time people had done them. And it made great copy for the newspapers. But this was about much more than image. At the end of the 70s, an upheaval took place that was to transform British politics and society. This is a Have modern you world. Unit? This is a modern Are you a world. member of the Transport and General oh. Workers? The winter of discontent, when the country ground to a halt, was the climax to ten years of industrial unrest. In the winter of discontent, it seemed to have boiled over. And you may remember those terrible pictures that were taken, you were too young, but they were taken of you know, unburied people who were unburied dead people kept in refrigerators because the local government workers wouldn't dig graves. You've got people in the NHS waiting for days on end for some attention. It was pretty grim, I must say. I think it stinks like all the other damn strikes in this country run by the filthy socialist communist union. The level of unhappiness with the unions and Labour government was so great that Margaret Thatcher and her team decided to try something that had never been done before, 
to win over traditional Labour voters. We targeted particularly wives of trade union members because they were all fed up with their husbands being at home, not working. Um, we targeted women generally because we had a woman leader the first time in Britain. There'd been a, a woman running a political party. Um, and we focused on what we call C2s, which is a socio-economic grouping, which really means skilled and semi-skilled workers who were traditionally not Conservative voters but supporters of the Labour Party. Advertising was devised with the help of a revolutionary innovation, focus groups or panels of floating voters. The devastating Labour isn't working campaign was aimed at the C2 voters they wanted to win over. Excuse me, is this a queue for the 50p stalls? No, mate. This is a queue for the unemployed. Well, 79 is a breakthrough in terms of negative election campaigning. What the Conservatives introduced with Saatchi and Saatchi and Tim Bell was negative advertising on a grand scale. Is this the queue for the 50p stalls? No, this is the queue for buying your own council house. Oh. Yeah, it's hardly moved in the last four years. Nowadays, the country seems to be standing still, waiting for jobs, operations, homes, everything. Is this the queue for the 50p stalls? 50p? <laughs> Haven't you heard of inflation? I'll tell you what I don't want to see. What's that? Labour in power again. Labour in power? Was that the Marx Brothers? No, nah, another bunch of comedians. <laughs> Coming shortly, The Conservatives, a great programme for all the family. During the campaign, Margaret Thatcher followed her marketing people's advice. Her radical vision to change Britain was not spelt out. Instead, she was sold as the cost-conscious housewife. What was on Mrs Thatcher's mind was the ordinary business of food for the family. What have you found people wanting to talk to you about uh, when you've been shopping? Well, when you're shopping, uh, they always talk to you about prices, often about tax, and they usually say something like, it can't go on like this. That's usually the phrase that I hear most of all. Thank you very much. She talked a lot about cleaning things. She talked a lot about keeping things in order. She talked a lot about the housekeeping. She talked about how a woman knows how to make ends meet. How much of the cost is that? Those 24. As a grocer's daughter and long a customer, she was entirely at home with the shopkeepers. But she kept a political eye on their prices. And there's a, well, I'm going to have some of the small ones. Some of the small ones. Can I have two pounds of the small yeah. ones? The Labour Party could see what the Tories were doing and refused to do the same. But I tell you this, I don't intend to end this campaign packaged like cornflakes. I'm going to be myself and we're going to win this election on the basis that we are all people who have our own approach, our own philosophy, and we're going to move together in that way. And there's a sort of ripple of approval and applause around the cabinet table because we didn't believe in that sort of thing. I don't think there'll be a party leader of any sort now, including the very small minority parties, who don't accept that they have to be packaged in some sort of way. The Conservatives' use of marketing techniques was vindicated. Margaret Thatcher was swept to power. By targeting traditional Labour voters, she had shattered the political consensus and moved the ground on which elections are won to the right. The question for Labour, how to respond? Parties at those elections are always in terrible internal trouble. And very vocal people, um, people with a great deal of charisma and a great deal of pull within the party, were offering the theory that we'd lost because we weren't sufficiently left wing. So we had the great crisis, four years of crisis, in which the Labour Party very nearly ceased to be. The Labour Party conference has voted itself into a constitutional limbo which it could inhabit for years, full point. You get ludicrous policy decisions like we're going to get out of NATO, we're going to get out of Europe, uh, we're going to uh, abolish the House of Lords, we're going to abolish everything, we're going to have uh, nationalise all the major companies. Labour split. <laughs> Senior moderates left to set up the SDP. We're not going to make a statement. Why not? Why? They knew that the voters who decide elections had moved to the right and weren't coming back. Michael Foote led those left into the 1983 general election. On, on the way to, we're on the way to victory. <laughs> You can have any problems with the manifesto today? No, no. not at all. His policies were higher taxes, tighter controls on business, and unilateral nuclear disarmament. Where's the driver? 
Thank you. Right over. Bye-bye. The party's presentation was shambolic. the lead to our own people, to the people of Europe, to the people of the world. So I say to you, be of good cheer. One of the members of the campaign strategy committee, as I recall, it was John Silken, said, Michael, will you shut up about unilateral nuclear disarmament? Every time you talk about it, you got go down two points in Bob's polls. And he was hurt, I think and said, this is the best pulpit I will ever have to propound what I believe very deeply about. And I'm not going to give up the opportunity to speak to the British public to try and convince them of what I know is right. Michael Foote's strategy presented an open goal to the Tories, who promptly put the ball in the back of the net. The Labour manifesto was an absolute sort of liability and it was exploited by the Tories not only by buying up manifestos and, and distributing them to their own supporters but also by one of the best ads of that period. It played to people's prejudices uh, really, really well, you know, the idea that we don't want these uh, mad lefties and again God knows what they'll do to the country. Labour's riposte, a lecture on economic theory. The moment you bring Labour back, we'll start an emergency programme of investment in Britain's investment-starved industry, transport, housing, new technology. Here's just one example of how it works. Invest money in sorely needed new homes and brickworks earn money and all the other construction industries. They all need to take on new workers. The workers stop getting dough money and start buying clothes for their children again. The Labour Party never used marketing men, never used advertising, never used communication techniques, because it thought these were the tools of the evil capitalists um, who were going around the place persuading the innocent public to buy products they didn't want, take out bank accounts they didn't need, and generally deprive them of their wealth so the money could be poured into the pockets of the owners and family owners and chairmen of all the different retail businesses and, and business houses. I mean, it sounds silly, doesn't it? But I'm afraid it's true. It's exactly what they thought at the time. So they didn't use modern marketing techniques. They thought it would contaminate their philosophy and their purity. Margaret Thatcher's victory in the Falklands sealed Labour's fate. It allowed her marketing team to present her as a great war leader. It was easier to make people forget the faltering economy and remember the freedom she'd given to 500,000 council house occupants who'd bought their own homes. We, the British people, are proud of what has been done. Proud of these heroic pages in our island story. Proud to be here today to salute the task force. Proud to be British. There was a candidate for president in the United States in the 19th century who said, I'd rather be right than president. And he may have been right, but he certainly wasn't president. I think that 1983 will show that Michael Foote was the last prime ministerial candidate uh, who will say, I'd rather be right than Prime Minister. Labour fell to its lowest share of the vote since World War II. No British party leader would again reject political marketing. I will be now giving another one later in the day, perhaps, and we go, but I'm not giving one at this moment, and you must understand that, and you mustn't continue to ask questions here. 
some of the vibe answer to other people. It is not fair to the other journalists to do it. I've said that I'm not giving one, and you must understand that as well as everybody else. Are you going to give your usual? No, you must understand that. Are you going to? You must understand that as well as everybody else. The lessons of the 1983 defeat would be forever engraved on the Labour Party's soul. What do you get when a financial firm with 66,000 people in 50 countries takes the time to understand your needs like it's just the two of you? Could it be the most powerful two-person financial firm in the world? You and us. UBS. You may know Shikara, roughly translated, the power of dreams. You see, in Japanese, you don't say have a dream. You say see a dream. Because what's the point in having dreams if you're not going to make them happen? I'll just grab your watch and uh, then you've got a, a phone on you as well. That'd be terrific. Cheers. I'll just grab your uh, phone as well and your house keys. Thank you. Lovely. Thanks ever so much. Cheers, mate. Thanks. Thank you. You're fine. Thank you. The brand new series of Darren Brown, Trick of the Mind, Friday at 9.30 on 4. Ah! Labour chose a new leader to fight the 1987 election. Unlike his mentor, Neil Kinnock was focused on achieving power. But first, he had to work out how to win back the magic million voters who decide elections. He might still have been singing Italian revolutionary songs in public, but he had a secret plan. Neil Kinnock rang me. And he laid out in an hour and a half's telephone conversation that he was going to immediately reorganize his office and get people in there who were uh, a much uh, more efficient, uh, better organized office as leader. He was going to establish a campaign strategy committee now, not just six months before an election. And one of the things he did was to bring in Peter Mandelson. Very hardworking, very shrewd, very disciplined person. The former television producer and Neil Kinnock agreed on some basic changes. We did simple things like typing speeches. I'd hardly ever spoken from a script in my life. But what we knew is that we had to do that because any, um, any casual or spontaneous remark that could be used by the press to inflict damage on me or on the Labour Party would be used. For the media, the story was still Labour's hard left image. In order to deal with this, Peter Mandelson copied the Tories and called in the professionals. His shadow communications agency set about creating Labour's first ever PR strategy. At the time, certainly at the time when I first became involved with the Labour Party, the conventional wisdom was that Labour was so anti-business uh, that, that it was impossible for it actually to hire an advertising agency. A sort of decent agency would be reluctant to work with Labour because they would be concerned about the impact it would have on, on their other clients. So raise the star and stand high. My impression of it was that it was a sort of um, beating back the sheer awfulness of the Labour Party's image, just uh, finding some plausible way of countering uh, a very firmly established image uh, of the Labour Party as being far too left-wing and flaky on all sorts of issues. It was a mammoth task. Neil Kinnock threw extremists out of the party, and for the first time, focus groups were called in to help reshape its image. 
They said that Labour politicians even looked too left-wing. Peter Mandelson got them to dress like bank managers and brought in the Red Rose. Now, great leader, what is it you have to say to <laughs> Down on your what, knees. <coughs> what do you want me to say? Okay. This is a participatory leadership. <laughs> The change that took place, twofold. One, people thought, ah, wait a minute, that does represent a hopefulness, an elan, that we've been desperate for in all these years of defeat. I mean, it didn't articulate it in that form, but you could see it. And when we chucked roses from the platform and used it on party publications, people immediately identified. Neil Kinnock became the first Labour leader to sell the party like a brand. Every detail would be subject to the marketing advisor's careful control. In the run-up to the 1987 election, focus groups were mainly used to help to refine the message. Uh, and in particular, they were used to understand uh, the image of, of the leader, uh, but also to, to pre-test advertising uh, and, and some of the broadcasts. And in particular, they were used to help uh, to develop and refine the, you know, the very famous Hugh Hudson uh, profile of Neil Kinnock, uh, which, which was hugely successful. Why am I the first Kinnock in a thousand generations to be able to get the university? Why is Glenys the first woman in her family in a thousand generations to be able to get the university? Was it because all our predecessors were thick? Did they lack talent? Those I think Labour may have been allowed themselves to get con. The people who thought this was wonderful were the media, the political correspondents, the television reviewers. They couldn't believe it. A, it was novel because the Labour Party was being so professional, but they liked it. It was the, had no impact on the wider electorate, no impact whatever. But the professionals wrote it up, and I think Labour, as it were, began, began to believe their own publicity. In 1987, Labour may have looked modern, but many of its policies were still hardline socialist, giving more control to the unions, raising tax for the rich, regulating the city, and unilateral nuclear disarmament. I would say the reason that the public didn't buy this, in many ways, rather professionally rebranded product is the reason why a lot of well-marketed things don't sell. It's because the thing itself isn't right. It isn't actually what people need. The packaging of Labour was getting better, but the message was still very confused, and the opposition product, the Conservative Party, was still strong. Once again, Margaret Thatcher's marketing people made the most of the socialist policies in Labour's manifesto. Nationalisation. Oblivious to the fact that 99% of British gas workers took up the offer of shares in the company they work for, they will renationalise British gas and British Telecom and force more companies into state control. Defence. At a time when Russian nuclear capacity is at its highest ever, they will reverse the policy of every Labour government since the war who have supported Britain's nuclear defence. Yes, I've got my uh, year's programme. Photo opportunities presented Margaret Thatcher as confident and in control. Some hopes. Have you got yours? Some hopes. Well, if we have an election early, we can go on holiday in August. Yeah. We have an election late. We won't go at all. No holiday. That's no right. Holiday. Well, I'll well, read that when I see it. Uh, I thought we'd go to Cornwall this year again, because we love it. She had given the swing voters who carried her to power what they wanted, money and property. Thousands more council houses had been sold off. Well, why do you want the house? Well, why do you, why do they, you want to get on, don't you? Their owners could pay for the stone cladding with profits from shares in newly privatised state industries. And union disputes were a distant memory. Selling the creator of this new prosperous Britain was not difficult. The 
million floating voters in marginal constituencies who decide elections return Margaret Thatcher to Downing Street for the third time. Neil Kinnock learned that changing his image was not going to be enough. He would have to ditch radical policies. Teams of market researchers were sent to marginal constituencies to ask people for their opinions about the party. They learned some hard truths. Seems very disorganised. Labour, Tory. Labour. <laughs> oh. Labour all the way through. <laughs> Can't be trusted. Labour, Tory, Alliance, SDP. Uh, so that again, can you please? Can't, Can't be, be trusted. trusted. Labour, Tory, Alliance, Tory. SDP. Has politicians I like. Labour, Tory, Labour. Alliance. Uh. <laughs> um, don't care mate. about people like me. <laughs> Labour, Tory, Alliance, Labour. SDP. The press was invited along so the country would know Labour was changing. Policy by policy, the party moved right towards the swing voters who had taken Margaret Thatcher to power. So what you get almost year on year, election defeat after election defeat, is Neil being pulled away from the political left, abandoning positions on unilateral disarmament, withdrawal from the European community, not greatly increasing public spending. I mean, all the left-wing causes. Kenny's view was that your policy should be dictated by what the polls said. And uh, the whole thing went very soft there, and I found it very unsatisfying. But that his view was that in order to win, you'd probably have to give up much of what you believed in, as he did himself, and it didn't work. So far, Margaret Thatcher's radical, ideological policies had made voters better off. But hidden in the 1987 manifesto was one that made them poorer, the poll tax. The public opposition to the poll tax took all of us, certainly took the Conservative Party at first by surprise to see people rioting in Trafalgar Square. Well, we could say to ourselves there, they're just the usual smelly, hairy kind of people who would riot against any Conservative policy. And then you saw pensioners protesting. Uh, pensioners, not exactly rioting, but coming fairly close. And, and you saw and heard really uh, quite sensible, middle-of-the-road people, apparently enraged by a policy that we had thought so sensible and unexceptional at the beginning. Margaret Thatcher's fatal mistake had been not to run the poll tax past her marketing people. The issue of the poll tax, I don't ever remember it being discussed in the 87 campaign. Had it been on the agenda, it would have been taken off the agenda pretty quickly because it is a fact of life that no political party in the Western world has been elected on a tax-raising platform since the Second World War. The Conservatives decided that Margaret Thatcher could no longer win elections. She was forced to resign. Ladies and gentlemen, we're leaving Downing Street for the last time after 11 and a half wonderful years and we're very happy that we leave the United Kingdom in a very, very much better state than when we came here 11 and a half years ago. John Major, the new leader of the Conservatives, scrapped the poll tax. The parties were converging in pursuit of floating voters. Had Mrs Thatcher remained, Labour would undoubtedly have won. One, because she'd have kept the poll tax, and that would have killed her in itself. And two, because people would have started using the other cliché, time for a change. But what again we know from the focus groups, from the opinion polls, is the arrival of John Major gave the impression that something new was happening. This was a new start. Mr Heseltine was back in the government, being all golden and glossy. All sorts of new faces were appearing on television. We didn't benefit from the it's time for a change syndrome because people almost subconsciously thought there'd been a change, as indeed in a sense there had. Here, inside the Sheffield Arena, Neil and Glenys Kinnock. In 
run-up to the 1992 election, the professionals told Labour it needed to look like a government in waiting. Sensing Labour's slickness might also be its undoing, John Major stood marketing theory on its head. He got out his soapbox and megaphone and toured the country. Just as they've done with every Labour government we've ever seen. When two jobs go to war, one is all that you can score. Well, all right. In the next parliament, we're going to make progress towards a basic rate of 20 pence for everyone, starting with those on the lowest income. I felt very comfortable with this direct one-to-one -one, uh, contact. And because I felt politics was drifting too much away from people, I wished to do something that was distinctive. And the soapbox worked. It was much derided by the political sophisticates of the day. But the crowds came. There they are, the chosen horse. And there were lots and lots of pictures of John Major being shouted at, having eggs thrown at him, not going away, sticking it out. And I think actually that was the, the, the absolutely Trump card in that election, that suddenly John Major was back in the streets with the people. It uh, contrasted most of all with the Thatcher image and inheritance, but it also contrasted with uh, me particularly, opposition leader, nice shiny red car, helicopter, rallies, everything click, click, slick, slick, and uh, the contrast between the Prime Minister's relative rawness and my attempts at sophistication may also have persuaded a few people in a critical areas. Not, not a huge number, but you don't need a huge number. Labour had ditched unpopular policies to try and get elected, but there was one sacred cow left. The Labour budget proposals, which I am announcing today, will promote recovery from recession and reform the tax and national insurance system. In other words, John Smith wanted to put up taxes to pay for pensions and child benefit, just the thing to frighten off floating voters. The shadow budget was definitely very unhelpful and, you know, it, it gave the Conservatives the ammunition that they were looking for uh, to attack Labour's campaign, you know, the double whammy, the tax bombshells, very, very, very effective. Last week, Labour's Mr Smith said that he wanted the biggest increase in taxes on incomes since the war. What it did was just to, 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 to sort of say to people, you have this nagging doubt at the back of your mind that this is what Labour are going to do, and hey, here it is confirmed. It sort of meant there was nowhere to go. It was, it was extremely unhelpful. So Labour would push up taxes and prices, and there's more. According to city forecasts, Labour would have to push up interest rates by 2.5%. That would add £40 a month to the average mortgage. The best political advertising, a key, the best political messages of any sort, key into a perception that is there amongst the electorate. And so there is that instant recognition that they think that as well. And with the uh, tax bombshell, that was uh, emphatically, the, emphatically the case. Neil Kinnock had transformed Labour's image and its policies, but the party fell to its fourth successive defeat. It was going to take revolutionary action to persuade the floating voters who decide elections to desert the Conservatives. Nice car, mate. New Astra Sport Hatch. Go drive. Full three song. F. Honey cool. And pump sorted. Splendid. One is utterly ravenous. Passes you, rude old chap. 
It's this season's must-have, Clarly. It's so you! Ahem. <clears throat> you don't have to be posh to be privileged. All you need is four years no claims on your car insurance, then privilege will guarantee to beat your renewal quote. Now give all the lardy our stuff a rest. Here, love. Get us a brew. Ten sugars are twelve. For cheaper car insurance, call Privilege or buy at privilege.com. You were made for me. Everybody tells me so. Don't risk getting stuck with the wrong partner. With thousands of cars locally every week, it couldn't be easier to find your perfect partner in Auto Trader. A laboratory mix-up changes four lives forever. This baby that I'm carrying now might not be ours. Our baby has been born to a white family. When do we get our kid back? Starring the Oscar-nominated Sophie Okonedo and Leslie Sharp. Born with two mothers, Thursday at nine, on four. By 1992, Labour was getting used to post-election hangovers. Four times in a row, it had failed to win over the swing voters in marginal constituencies who decide general elections. The pain only got worse when it discovered how, despite all its efforts, it had failed to change its image. We asked people to describe this person that was the Labour Party, and they described uh, you know, a middle-aged man in a cloth cap against a sort of old-fashioned industrial background, you know, chimney stacks with smoke billowing out, you know, with a pint in his hand. And it, it, it was just quite extraordinary how little the party had moved on. I therefore declare that Tony Blair is elected leader for Labour. The election of a public schoolboy barrister as leader was to transform its fortunes. Tony Blair had a clear vision of what Labour needed to do to get elected. There was just this real sense of force and single-mindedness. There was a determination to move at last to the centre ground and be a mainstream party. There was always wings to the party, there were always different groups, and Tony said, no, if you want to get elected, this is what you're going to do. But while Tony Blair was looking forward, much of his party was looking back with nostalgia to the time when politics were defined by class and ideology. Clause 4 of Labour's constitution still stated that the workers should own the means of production. It would have to go. It was symbolic, and so knocking it down was importantly symbolic. But secondly, in the knocking of it down, there was always going to be a fight. There was going to be a, an element of the Labour Party that would put up a, a huge fight against the removal of Clause 4. And so Tony Blair was going to get what he wanted, a public fight in which he appeared to be brave, in which he appeared to be doing something important, and which he finally won. In their changes, Tony Blair and his inner circle of advisers were guided every step of the way by focus groups. They told them there was an even bigger problem. Labour's image as the party of tax and spend had stuck. For many years, Labour had this great millstone around its neck as the party of economic incompetence. And, and struggling to overcome that was a mountain to climb. It was a problem that made Labour unelectable. So Tony Blair promised not to raise income tax. The Tories were sensing trouble. The Labour Party is supposed to go around believing in nationalisation, the redistribution of wealth, state dependency um, and the growth in the public sector and raising taxes. That's what they're supposed to do. All of a sudden, this Labour Party, under Blair, said it wasn't going to do that. Labour decided to fight the 1997 election as new Labour. But focus groups said they still weren't sure they could trust the party. The strategist's answer was a first in political marketing to underwrite Tony Blair's promises with a written guarantee. Tonight, I'm giving you just five examples of the pledges we will make, pointers to the type of change we want. I would also like to give you one of these cards. It spells out these early pledges that we're making tonight. What happened was that I think in focus groups leading up to the development of the pledge card, it was decided that certain aspects of Labour's policy offer were the most appealing to those key floating voters, and those were the aspects that were featured on the pledge cards. Never before had market research been used to shape policy before selling it to the electorate. The sales pitch wasn't always perfect. 
Those five pledges are crucial. Those five pledges are essential. You can see I can't find them. <laughs> Tony, is it on there? <laughs> no, I found it. I found it. <laughs> Anyway, there it is, Prop 5. Liberal Democrat leaders like Shirley Williams refused to use focus groups. What's more, they wanted to put up taxes to pay for better services. It's not so much focus groups. It's the fact that politicians slavishly follow focus groups. So when focus groups, in a kind of slightly move, you know, mushy way, end up with some broad conclusion, it now becomes the case that very powerfully the argument is made that politicians need to follow those consensuses. I mean, I don't know who wrote the Gettysburg Address. Was it a primitive American focus group? When Churchill said, never in the field of human conflict has so much been owed by so many to so few, was that drafted by somebody else? No, I mean, I think the corruption of politics by presenting it in terms of technique and technology and focus and polls, is one of the reasons why people feel no one's interested in us. They don't want to know what we think. They've got their own way of marketing their wretched product and expecting we, as innocent consumers, will buy it. But the Labour strategy was working. Despite using the tactics that had served him five years earlier, John Major was struggling to make his attacks hit home. I can remember in, in 97, hours of discussion and debate with the great intellectuals of <coughs> the Conservative Party and the advisers trying to decide what should we say. We knew we shouldn't say they're dressing up in our clothes. Why? Because it made them less frightening. Um, because we don't believe we're frightening. Secondly, um, we knew that we shouldn't say he didn't mean it, though we were quite tempted with that. The Saatchis finally proposed using an old trick that had served the Conservative Party so well in previous elections a hard-hitting negative advert that presented Tony Blair as Faust being guided by the devil. You can say anything. Well, what do you mean? Say you won't put up taxes. But I will. So what? Just say it. Go on, it's easy. I know I'd have to put up taxes. Just say it. Say it. I... I... I won't put up taxes. Now say it like you mean it. I won't. No, I vow. I promise. I pledge. That's it. Go on. I pledge not to raise income tax rates for the five years of the next Labour government. But John Major knew the negative attacks that had delivered victory in previous elections now rang hollow. He blocked it. Well, I thought it uh, depicted a degree of dishonesty um, and a degree of utter lack of conviction in uh, the opposition party that uh, I thought may be there, but it hasn't yet been proven. And I think when it's proven, that's the time. May maybe Faust should have been shown after some years, uh, after 1997, but not at the time. The policies that frighten off floating voters had finally been removed. Tony Blair was now able to court them with carefully crafted party election broadcasts, like this one starring Pete Postlethwaite. After 18 years and four election defeats, Labour finally turned the tables on the Tories. I mean, you've got to be honest with people. All that nonsense about tax. Who do the Tories think they're kidding? <laughs> oh, it's cold, isn't it? <laughs> There's VAT on heating now, although they said they'd never do it. They give with one hand and take with the other. There's 22 new taxes, 22. <laughs> Listen to me going on. I sound like a flipping taxi driver. The Pete Postlethwaite broadcast was trying to be reassuring and say that you, you didn't have to have voted Tory in the last election. It was now a new Labour Party, so it was safe to vote Labour again. Hello. The rain stopped. And it was also trying to say something really optimistic. Uh, you know, doesn't have to be this way, though, does it? Eh? I mean, the future could be so much brighter. Things can be better. That's why you have to vote. It's too late. Hey, don't worry about that. Have this one on me. The wings on Pete Postlethwaite, the driver, was 
a sign that, you know, it may have been slightly cheesy, but it was a sign that things were going to be uplifting and positive if you did it. There was some sort of light at the end of this Tory tunnel. Tony Blair's marketing campaign carried him to a landslide victory, but turnout was lower than at any time since the Second World War. He repeated the feat four years later, and once again the number of people voting fell. I, my colleagues, will be out every day in every part of Britain talking to the British people about our... This time around, more people than ever are saying they're not going to vote. If you look at, for instance, what happened in 2001, where in, in a, number, a number of safe Labour seats lost a massive amount of turnout, 20% or more in some seats, I think that was a sign of core Labour vote feeling somewhat neglected because Labour's message was targeting floating voters, Middle England, in marginal seats and not them. Because things didn't turn out as... Um, as differently as we expected, you know, the Labour government has become sort of middle ground, Tory government, in, you know, that we saw in the past. I think people are less likely or excited about voting. I think it nowadays it's a lot to do with brand and image and just the way the world's going nowadays and how people portray themselves. Um, I think it's, it's almost like sitting on the fence so they can grab voters from every sector and they all probably do that. I think we should tell more of the marketing men and the focus groups to just go and jump in a lake. The political system is going to hell in a handcart if it goes down that route. The public will just have no truck with it in a few years, and that could be immensely damaging. We need politics to get back to some of the central verities that have always been there. Of course you use modern techniques, but keep them in their place. Don't let them take over the system itself. More and more people are rejecting the mainstream parties and resorting to other means of political expression. The public doesn't feel it can get at its political leaders, so what it does is to get at, uh, as it were, an issue and try to make the greatest possible impact for that issue, but it usually means they do it, as it were, bypassing the leaders. And there are leaders moaning that there's no real contact and the public's out of touch and so on. I think we have an awful lot to answer for. Truth is, I thought it mattered. I thought that music mattered, but does it bollocks, not compared to how people matter? fight and die for great principles. And until the parties have great principles, people in general, and young people in particular, won't feel any obligation to go out on polling day if it's raining. What we want is more ideological politics. That's necessary for democracy, and it's necessary for good government. For all the latest news, statistics and analysis in the lead-up to the 2005 UK general election, log on to channel4.com slash election. Next tonight, an unforgiving terrain in winter. Nick Middleton's going to extremes in the Silk Route through the Gobi Desert.